Hi everyone, we might get started. I think we're two minutes over. But you're all very resilient, so I'm sure you're fine with that. <laughs> You'll be able to cope with it. Um, my name is Peter, so I'm the Career Development Manager here in the Business School, and this is my colleague Tamsin. Hi, I'm Career Development Advisor in the Business School. Mm. So that's the introductions. <laughs> uh, so this evening, we're going to talk about how to be positive, flexible and resilient in this very quickly changing environment. Um, things are just changing, it seems to be quicker and quicker, doesn't it? September and people are already talking about Christmas. Have you made your Christmas plans yet? <laughs> That's a time where we really need to be resilient, isn't it? <laughs> so we're going to actually address what resilience really is and then how to respond to our events, particularly adverse ones. And then the impact of our thoughts. Our thoughts have a lot to do with resilience and we'll give you quite a few helpful resources as well. You don't have to worry about taking lots of notes um, because we will make our PowerPoint available to you. So you'll get an email with the PowerPoint. <laughs> okay, so just a pretty dog picture really. <laughs> um, so stuff does happen. So this poor little dog, my world is spinning. Um, so resilience helps us cope when our world is spilling, spinning. And in terms of why, it just seems to be a very topical thing these days, doesn't it? We're seeing quite a lot about resilience in the media. There are workshops about resilience. I think it's the pace of change. The economy has a lot to do with it. Um, when we were doing workshop for this research for this workshop, um, um, Christchurch came a lot mm. up a lot, didn't it? It certainly did, yeah. yeah. Heaps, yeah. yeah. Uh, and other sort of significant world uh, events like um, uh, things like fear of terrorism and those sorts of things, which may not have been so um, dominant in the past. Yeah. yeah. Um, the global financial crisis seems to have had an impact. Even now, they're talking a lot about that. Just economy in gen general, um, technology, the pace of change, the internet, digitisation, all of that is having a big impact and making us sort of have to be more resilient to cope with it. There are greater expectations in the workplace. Um, there seems to be this thing where we have to do more with less. And short-term contracts, part-time work are becoming more and more common. Uh, and so the idea of sort of a job, Monday to Friday, nine to five, is slowly diminishing. And then stress and burnout is increasing because of all of this. So resilience is very important and just seems to be becoming more so. Yeah, and that burnout, one of the effects of, of um, uh, having all that technology is that now, do you, ever, do you ever feel as though you get away from work? Are you always contactable? Well, most of us are. We've got our phones, we've got computers, and people are expecting us to, um, to work later in the evening on weekends and things like that. They're expecting us to be present in the workplace even when we're not present in the workplace. Uh, another th issue with, um, with millennials is that whole fear of missing out. So people putting stress on themselves because they want to do anything. And um, there's been a lot written uh, recently about how millennials uh, are burning out earlier than, um, than other previous generations because they just they want to get everything done. They want to, they want to be doing the gym at five o'clock in the morning and they want to be um, socialising at 11 o'clock at night. And in the end, your, your resilience can, um, can weaken in front of, with that um, happening. So, uh, I mean, one of the things that um, uh, can affect our resilience is some sort of myths that we live with. Um, uh, and one of those things is happiness is a, is a natural state, that we should all be happy all of the time. Well, actually, no. Um, uh, evolution's left, left us with a fairly strong fight or flight res response. So happiness is something that we have sometimes, but it's certainly not something, uh, a state that we are naturally programmed to be in all the time. Um, there's also this, this sort of myth that um, if you're frustrated, then you're actually defective, that, that you, you, um, you shouldn't be frustrated. Well, again, that's, um, it's, being frustrated is as normal as being happy. So there's, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, there's, a, there's a sense um, that in order to be happy, in order to, be, to be, uh, create a better life, then we have to get rid of all those um, negative feelings, that we have to exclude them from our lives. 
But actually, um, uh, doing that can actually do you more harm than good, so not, not such a wise idea. Uh, and um, and there's, there's probably one of the greatest myths of all, uh, the myth that you can control what you think. Um, and um, we may think that we can, but, um, but it's actually our, what we, our control over what we think is actually relatively limited. So what's resilience? It's the ability to, to bounce back from uh, adversity. I think you said, um, Peter, it's, it's um, uh, like a, um, a tree. Rather than, um, rather than breaking, you bend down and then you come back again. So that's a sort of a visualisation that, um, uh, that you can have. It's the ability to work through, through challenges, to not be overwhelmed by them. And it's the b ability to overcome obstacles, not to be stopped by them. Uh, and as it says, you fall down seven times, bounce back and get up that eighth. So I've got some examples here. So um, Starbucks. So Howard Schultz, he gave, if he had given up after being turned down by banks 242 times, there might not be Starbucks. Some people, you know, may think that might not be a bad thing. <laughs> but, uh, it just depends. Uh, JK Rowling. If she'd stopped being, after being turned down by multiple publishers, we wouldn't have Harry Potter. Um, there's another, another Harry Potter coming out, well not <laughs> Harry Potter, but another movie set in that world in November, if you're fans. <laughs> uh, I think it's mid-November. It's set 80, 80 years before the Harry Potter world in New York, which will be different. Walt Disney, can you imagine a world without Disneyland? Um, 302 times he had to try and get his um, concept through and get the money and the funding for it. Okay, so just going to show you our um, DVD. <clears throat> so Steve Jobs is very sort of, um, he's a well-known person with a lot of resilience. Okay, so while you've been listening to that, you've probably sort of determined some factors that made him resilient. So, um, so at, at each of your tables, just take a couple of minutes to discuss the factors that you identified in that video that made Steve particularly resilient during those, what were quite challenging and difficult times. So at each of your tables. Okay, it, it, it would be great now if you'd actually sh share with the room. So could each table just um, shout out one, uh, what you thought was a, uh, how he showed resilience during those t t hard times. So start the front table at the front there. One particular factor that helped him. He had a really positive attitude all the time. Positive mm -hmm. attitude, yep, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. How about this table here? We talked about the kind of trust in the unknown and that trust and uncertainty. Yes, he talked quite a bit about trust, didn't he? Yeah. Was, yeah. He sort of thought that it would all work out. And that, um, and that faith that, yes, things, would, would be, uh, things might be hard now, but they would be better in the future. Yeah. And how about this table at the front here? Um, um, we're quite similar to the other table there, um, it's his ability to actually deal with uncertainty. Yep. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. And, and, and anyway, putting himself in that situation as well. Actually putting himself in that, that really difficult situ yeah, situation. Yeah, some yeah. of that was a choice to mm. drop mm. Indeed, and, and having the intestinal fortitude to know that if he walked that, was it seven miles to, to, just to get a really good meal um, <laughs> one day a week. So, um, so yeah. Put, so yeah, really putting it out there. Yeah. And really finding something, or uh, not settling until you find something else. Mm -hmm. Indeed. And how about the table behind? Passion for what he was doing. Passion to do what he was really interested in. Yeah, that, I mean that shone through, didn't it? And, and it shone through in his message there at the end about don't settle. Um, uh, also, the fact that he, he, he sort of learnt from um, learnt so much from his mistakes, I think that also came through a lot, didn't it? Anything he, that you noticed? In it? 
He talked about curiosity and intuition and he talked about having the confidence to follow your heart. Um, so those things stood mm. out for me. Mm. Yeah. Absolutely. So. so he was able to regulate his emotions. Um, he didn't sort of let the fear of failure or embarrassment and things like that stop him from actually trying. And even if he failed, he just picked himself up after a while. Um, quite quickly actually, and started again and tried something else. And he did that multiple times. Mm. He seemed to sort of embrace challenge. He didn't sort of see it as a barrier. He actually accepted it and embraced it, saw it as an opportunity, I think. Um, then of course you've got persistence in the face of setbacks. He also, I think, saw failure as sort of like basically helpful feedback. And these are all things that help when it comes to resilience. Uh, positive thinking, he did sometimes, you know, things did get him down, uh, but then he would sort of reframe it and think positively about the situation. Because how many of us could actually feel that being sacked by, from one of the most major companies in the world was actually, in the end, a really good thing? Hindsight helps though. <laughs> True, <it> helps. hindsight <laughs> is a fine thing, yes. <laughs> yeah. So these are the factors that do help with resilience. Um, positive thinking, uh, sort of being able to regulate your emotions. Those are probably the key, but the other ones as well. I think the other ones really do s fall out of those first two. Mm. Um, so what about you? So we'd just like you to sort of like take a moment, talk about it on your tables if you want. Think about um, what do you observe about yourself when you are resilient? And then what do you, observe about yourself when you're not and the impact sort of you know mentally physically socially emotionally when you're not being resilient just take a couple of minutes to think about that and maybe talk about it with each other okay I think if we wrap up your dis group discussions now this one's a lot more personal, so I'm not going to pick on tables, but if anyone's happy about sharing, sharing any of, the, of the, these um, uh, answers to these questions um, uh, with the group, um, uh, I'd encourage you to, but it, it, it's, it's very much voluntary because it's, it's a lot more personal, this, than, um, than talking about Steve Jobs. <laughs> so is anyone, anyone happy to share perhaps what, what they observe about their self when they are particularly resilient? <laughs> I think you're resilient when you actually believe in, you, believe in the outcome that you're um, mm. focused on. Mm. You're passionate about, about your ability to achieve it or passionate about somehow achieving that goal no matter what. So that, that, that passion um, enables your resilience, yeah? Anyone else? We were just talking about how you don't get out of your comfort zone to kind of face something that makes you feel uncomfortable. You don't have that experience, it enables you to be resilient the next time. Mm -hmm. so okay, so, so, so adversity being actually an advantage because you're then able to better cope with um, adversity in the future? And it's stretching and growing your boundaries as well, what you're able to do, you just stretch each time a little bit more. Mm. Mm. So that comfort zone expands each time. Yeah. Mm. Anyone else? Oh, how about that, that's that second time? What, 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 what do you observe about yourself when, um, when you're not so resilient? Is anyone happy to share that? Well, for me, Sometimes it's when I'm tired. Mm -hmm. I, I tend not to bounce back so quickly if I'm physically exhausted or mentally exhausted. <coughs> About you? Probably the same actually. I think tiredness has quite a big impact on it. Um, it can affect mood, definitely. So if you're not feeling resilient, I think it's um, out of balance. Uh, that's how I tend to describe it these days. I'm not quite balanced. Um, so I might be feeling anxious or unhappy or whatever it is, but I just feel out of balance. Mm. Hmm. Yeah. Um, a lot of this is about emotional self-awareness. 
and um, understanding our emotions and how things have an influence on emotions. Also sort of th seeing things a bit like Steve Jobs, sort of seeing things don't sort of dwell on the failures, just it's an opportunity to learn and instead focusing on success. If we go back to sort of what we were talking about before, from an evolution perspective, we're actually programmed to notice our failures because it's through noticing the failure that our ancestors actually survived. Those who didn't notice failures and didn't notice that there was a lion in the bush, <laughs> they're the ones that died. So our ancestors were the ones that dwelled on the failure and the negative and the scary things that might be in the bushes. Um, so it's kind of an inbuilt thing that is really hard for us to cope with. Um, understanding choice, that we do have choices, being aware of other people around us. Being able to deal with conflict uh, is, can be really hard. And understanding that there is a really big link between sort of um, what we think, our thoughts, our emotions and our body. Um, so what we think can have a big impact on even just something like our heart rate. Um, our autonomous, autonomic nervous system <laughs> has a big impact on that. Um, so all of those things, just emotions have such a big part to play in con controlling them or maybe managing them is a better word. Hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, no, someone mentioned uh, that, that when they were not feeling so resilient, often the, the um, motivation to exercise, the motivation to get out and do stuff that you usually do. And I think that's also part mm. of that, that whole mm. physical co co connection, that you, 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 you lose those, those, those motivations. Uh, and then your, your, your body doesn't get the exercise and then that goes back to the brain. So it can be a bit of a, a vicious circle when that happens. One of the things we're combating is sort of like that whole left-right brain conflict. So your right brain tries to say the colour, but your left brain is insisting on reading the word. So trying to control our thoughts is actually really difficult because that battle is going on within us. Um, you had a good... Yeah, um, uh, I was at a workshop recently um, uh, talking about a particular part of th thought control. Uh, and he li I love this example. He said, so if you can think about a box, think about what colours that box? What shapes that box? Is it rectangular? Is it a round box? Does it have any particular exciting features? Is it perhaps blue with polka dots? Uh, does it have something poking out of the box? Now don't think about the box. What do you do? And, what, and what, <laughs> what, what are you thinking about now? You're probably, you're starting to think about that box because I told you not to. <laughs> so that's the, the, the whole thing is that it's really, really hard to control your thoughts because your thoughts do not want to be controlled. <laughs> and also our brain doesn't process the word not. So if you tell yourself don't fall over, you're going to fall over. <laughs> yeah, so if you tell yourself you know, things like don't, not, do not, anything like that, the negatives, our brain doesn't really process negatives. Um, so as soon as you start thinking don't fall over, don't trip, don't trip, you trip. <laughs> <laughs> yes, strange thing in your body. In the brain. In the brain. Okay. So yeah, so it's, it's more of a fact of managing your thoughts than controlling them. So, um, because you can manage aspects of your thoughts, but it's actually that, that, that level of total control that's, um, uh, that, that's a, a lot more difficult. Actually, frankly, um, almost impossible. Mm. Um, but but it's, it's also re realising that there's nothing that's actually good or bad except you thinking that it's good or bad. So it's actually thinking about the, the effect that your thoughts are having on you on your, and your, on your resilience. So when it comes to managing your thoughts, um, <clears throat> it often starts with self-talk. If you think about the things you actually tell yourself, so you do something that is wrong, uh, and then you beat yourself up about it. You tell yourself you're an idiot, you're stupid. What were you thinking? Uh, and we actually talk to ourselves in a way that we would never talk to another person. Um, we're criticising ourselves, blaming ourselves, putting ourselves down quite a lot. Some of us do it more than others. 
um, that's sort of um, based on whether you're sort of like more of an optimistic person or more of a pessimistic <laughs> person, but we all do it. Um, it goes back to that sort of evolutionary thing where we're programmed to be negative. But unfortunately, we beat ourselves up quite badly. Um, it is possible to practice positive self-talk and just be aware of our thoughts, monitor our thoughts, and when we catch, catch ourselves being rude to ourselves, sort of just, you know, stopping and sort of thinking about what we're actually saying and um, being kind to ourselves, essentially. It's hard to do, but um, it's a thing that it's really good to practice and get in the habit of doing. Um, so when you find yourself sort of thinking negatively, challenge those thoughts, um, work to replace them with positive ones or reframe it. So looking at that, what, what, to, what do you read there? Oh, okay. So we have, we, have, we have an optimist in the audience. So, yeah, from the laughter I would say most of you. <laughs> What's actually was quite reassuring to me is um, I'm the pessimist in the room and Tamsin's the optimist. But Tamsin also read Opportunity is Nowhere, which made me feel so much better. <laughs> Sorry, Tamsin. It's perfectly all right. <laughs> um, basically, optimism is associated with way better health outcomes. Um, just from a health perspective, trying to be an optimist is actually a good idea. Um, they're the type of people, you know, life gives you lemonades, you make margaritas. <laughs> uh, forget the lemonade. Yeah, sorry, life gives you lemons, they make margaritas, not lemonade. It's boring. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it has a positive effect on your mental, your physical health. Um, it helps you respond better when it comes to sort of chronic diseases as well. Um, way, there's studies that show way better outcomes if you're an um, optimist. And this is also something that can be learned. Uh, you can actually practice it and train yourself to be, be more optimistic. And you think of, of, of in a career context, what, how incredibly different those two statements are if you're actually thinking opportunity is now here. Yeah. So this is another way of looking at the optimism and the pessimism. So I'm definitely trying to teach myself that the glass is half full, not half empty. But sometimes it can actually be quite good because cheer bunnies like me sometimes like to look at things so positively that we don't see the, perhaps some, some downsides and some disadvantages. So in any work team it's really actually good to have a mix of, of optimists and pessimists. Um, uh, because it might be that pessimist that actually uh, makes you realise that such what sounded like a fantastic idea, you might have to actually look at this risk and counter that risk before you actually um, carry that idea out. Yeah, so it's a spectrum. So you can mm. sort of, you know, some people are way there, some people are there. You're trying to sort of be an optimist with a little dose of realism. <laughs> Indeed. Um, putting positive thinking into practice, so you can actually reframe what you think, so if you sort of, oh I'm not going to do that, I've never done it before, um, instead reframe it to think that it's an opportunity to learn something new. Um, you know, you might think that it's too complicated, so just, you know, sort of once again, it's thinking outside the square or tackle it from a different angle. So it's just reframing your thoughts and making them more positive. And this is really important in careers because how often do we actually not take advantage of an opportunity because we've actually self-talked our way in a negative way into thinking that um, we can't do it so we just, we, um, we won't take advantage of that opportunity. You know, if Steve Jobs had a thought it's too radical a change and hadn't <laughs> thought let's take a chance. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm not going to get any better at this. You know, he just, yeah, I'll give it another try. But it does take practice to do this. Okay. Yeah, so acceptance and commitment training is, is a way of increasing your, um, your resilience. So the acceptance part of it is accept your internal right, life and try not to struggle with it. Um, and be present in the moment rather than spending all your, um, all your life looking, looking backwards and thinking, oh, if only I'd done this. Just, just accept it and move on. Um, the, the, the C is, is um, uh, the commitment is choosing the direction in life that you value and then 
T, taking action to live the life that you really want. So it's a, it's, it's a, it's a combination of a few different things, um, uh, practices to actually help you uh, to become more resilient. Uh, but, by crikey, um, uh, of course, as, as we talked about, your, 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 your brain and your body is often fighting against um, you. So you've got the, the whole, I want to control my life versus evolution, where, um, where your, your body is, is doing the whole fight and flight, um, uh, because that's what's worked in the past. It may not necessarily work now because, because the, it, we don't often, as often have those sorts of situations. But, um, but in, a, in a career context, we can, uh, we can take flight strategies, we can, we can take a day off because we just can't bear going in to face that difficult situation. Or, um, or in, the, um, uh, in, the, uh, in the fight strategies, um, uh, you might find that, um, uh, that you're trying to force thoughts away, force feelings away. But accepting them and actually just moving on is a, is a better way of, of coping with that. If you think of it like a pressure cooker, if you keep trying to sort of suppress the thoughts, the feelings, the emotions, um, at some point there is going to be an explosion. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and as you, you were talking about, the, the, another fight strategy is, is that whole self-bullying, that whole beating you, yourself up. So every time you find yourself doing that, think, actually, um, uh, would, I, would, I, would I give this advice to a friend? If you wouldn't, then perhaps you shouldn't give that advice to yourself. Uh, and taking a charge um, in the, the sort of the, the fight or flight thing, um, using some affirmations to replace those negative thoughts can, um, can be a way of, of, of overcoming that sort of that fight um, response. And also challenging the thoughts as well. And challenging the thoughts, indeed. So you could, yeah. <laughs> I'm just reading, arguing, countering or challenging thoughts. I can just imagine you having a fight with yourself. <laughs> Sorry, imagination, funny thing. So, um, so another aspect of, of acceptance and commitment training is, is actually to, to sit down and think, okay, what is the actual issue? Uh, because sometimes when we, when we actually step back a bit and, and clarify that issue or that problem in our mind, we actually realise that what we thought was the issue might not be the major part of the issue at all. It may be something else entirely. So, so making sure that, um, that, uh, that what you're struggling with is the, is the actual, the core issue. Um, and then thinking about it, okay, are my feelings unproductive and unhelpful? Yeah. Is there anything that I can do about the situation? If I can't do anything about that situation, then actually just accepting that, that, um, that you might actually just have to find a quiet space just to do that step back and make room for those bad feelings. Don't shut them away, just, just accept them and then set them aside. Because if, 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 the, if there's actually nothing you can do about the situation, then there's no point in, in going over and over and over on the situation again. So accepting those feelings and then placing them aside. This is from the Executive Coaching Centre, sorry, reading sideways. Um, they do workshops uh, here in Auckland on this sort of stuff. And one of the examples he gave is a place where you could find a quiet spot, was sort of driving um, home from work. Uh, you're alone, presumably, in your car, so that would give you a chance to actually sort of be able to sort of think about what happened and make room for the bad feelings and there's no one around that you could possibly scare. <laughs> And it, uh, that can uh, be but that taking yourself away from other people can also stop the um, the emotional backlash that could happen if someone disturbs you while you're still doing that processing of those those difficult feelings. Um, however, if though if, if in that um, in that consideration of the problem you, you actually realise that your feelings are productive and helpful and that you actually can change the situation, then um, then working, taking that committed action based on your values to address that situation, um, uh, then, then that's, that, that, that's something that you can do. So there's a, there's a couple of different options um, uh, in, in uh, how to cope with uh, those difficult situations. I think the key is just stepping back and analysing mm. it and don't letting the emotions get in the way. Yeah. Um, so taping, taking a deep breath and just thinking about it. <laughs> and yeah, just to think about that. So um, this is choosing something. one's attitude. Yeah. Yeah. So this is something we do have a choice over. So 
like Viktor Frankl, so in the Holocaust, he um, chose a very positive attitude. Which must have been darn hard in the Holocaust. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of the time he was thinking about his wife uh, and it was getting back to his wife that was holding him together. So having someone or something like that, um, that means a lot, a great deal to you. Okay, so some, some, some positive strategies for, um, uh, for, for developing your resilience. Nutrition and sleep, it may, it may sound obvious, but, um, but making sure that you're well fed and that you're well rested are actually incredibly important in resilience. There's a lot of studies that, that show that if you're neither of those, then your resilience um, really does dip. Um, to, to actually practice activities that increase your energy, so, um, so, so actually identifying those, those um, activities and practicing those more. And conversely, activities that really that deplete your energy, that you, you're kind of dreading and it's, so it's really taking you down. See if you can minimize those activities. Um, we've talked about practicing that, that positive self-talk and, um, and talking to yourself like you're, you're a friend, not an enemy. Um, Focusing on the issues that are within your control. Um, and I think um, um, that I've, I've read a little bit um, over the, the last few days about the Christchurch earthquakes and, um, and how the people who actually struggled most with the uh, resilience during the earthquakes were the ones that required within themselves a high level of control because they, they actually didn't have, um, they didn't have control over what was going. Whereas those that actually were able to um, most, mostly be resilient were those who um, uh, were able to accept that they didn't have to have control over all events in their lives. Um, and so it's this, there's been a lot of work done on study, uh, studies on the, um, the Christchurch earthquakes. A lot of interesting reading out there. I was um, having coffee with a friend over the weekend on Sunday and she was talking about how she went into the office. She started off talking about a lot of things that were happening at work and it was mainly around people issues and personnel and a lot of change of staff and basically she didn't have much control at all. So then she was talking about how on Saturday she went into the office and she cleaned up her office. So she <laughs> threw out a whole lot of paper um, she spent seven hours tidying up her <laughs> office. So we were, as we do, analysing that. And it was because she had control over that. She could decide whether to throw that piece of paper out or not. And that was about the only thing that is in her control at the moment at work. Um, so seven hours just basically recycling a whole <laughs> lot of paper. But she, it made her feel better because it did give her that sense of control. Hmm. And connecting with others, also really important. Uh, and again, to use the Christchurch earthquake example, a, a lot of um, uh, activities that happened uh, during the, the Christchurch earthquake was because people wanted to help other people. You know, crap was going on all around them, but connecting with other people made everyone feel much better. And so they became much more resilient as a result of the, um, uh, the feedback, positive feedback that others gave them. One that um, I like is the find three good things. And I do notice that if I don't do that on a regular basis, I do start to get out of balance. And that's one of the ways I get myself back in balance. And um, you can do it at any time, but I tend to do it at night, um, just after I've gone to bed. And I just think about the day and I don't limit myself to three. <laughs> but it's, it can be just minor little things. So like one day I was waiting for the bus and I saw a bird who seemed to be sort of just digging and digging and digging and digging in the garden. Um, and it was just, yeah, just lovely watching it. Or it might be a rainbow. Or the other day I had five tuis in my kowai tree. Um, just little things like that um, can make all the difference. And part of that is, is being present. Um, uh, so not uh, uh, that whole mindfulness, uh, it, it may sound like a buzzword now, but it's, a, it's actually being present in the moment and noticing what's going on around you, uh, rather than letting yourself be taken over by your thoughts and your feelings, um, uh, actually bringing yourself out of that and starting to notice the world. Because we tend to focus on the past and the future, but we don't tend to focus on the present. 
And that's um, all those racy colouring in books. Who, who would have thought a couple of years ago that, that, that um, the biggest seller last Christmas would have been adult colouring in books? Mm -hmm. So go figure. But a lot of people get a lot of benefit out of them because they have to concentrate on colouring in. They have to really focus on that. And that allows them to exclude other stuff that's actually intervening in their, um, in their mind and just have some, some mental peace. That's why some people like gardening, for example, it does the same thing for some people. Mm -hmm. And my sister, I could never understand it, she liked hanging out the washing. But it was the, oh, no, that's only, weird. It was the, <laughs> it was the only time at home where she could be on her own. She was sure that the children wouldn't turn up at the clothesline because mm -hmm. they'd get a job. But also too, it was just the whole meditative, rhythmic thing of doing that and being outside as well. Mm. Another great thing as far as um, uh, improving your resilience, oddly enough, is being nice to other people. So being kind to others can actually help boost their resilience, but also your resilience. Um, and visualizations, someone told me years ago, uh, so I practice this every morning, um, uh, I, I, I visualize that it's going to be a really good day and then I give myself a big beam in the, um, in the mirror every morning. And so the first thing that really that I do every day is, um, is a really nice positive thing. So those sorts of visualizations, there can be all sorts of different visualizations, but, uh, but that can assist you as well in just being able to cope with life, frankly. Mm -hmm can be a goal, seeing yourself actually achieving the goal. Some people do um, vision boards, so they actually do cut stuff out and have a, have a board that they look at every day. Um, one thing to remember though is get help if you're struggling, or even if it's just to share with friends or family or colleagues what's going on, that can um, be very helpful as well. And yeah, if, if things are really overwhelming you, um, seek professional help. Um, uh, that's what the professionals are there for, to assist you through times where you just can't really cope. Mm -hmm. um, so we have talked a bit about optimism and things like that. If you actually want to take a test online <laughs> to figure out whether you're an optimist or a pessimist, um, I actually did that test. I thought I was being a realist. I don't know. Um, but they have lots of different tests. University of Pennsylvania, so authentic happiness. So they have lots of different tests. You can figure out what your strengths are. They've got one about 24 core strengths, a general happiness scale. They've got the grip test. Um, so if you enjoy that sort of thing, you could always go and have a look. You've got to register, but don't worry about that. Um, they're very happy for, you don't have to go to the University of Pennsylvania to do the test. They're happy for everyone to do it because it's just more um, information for them for their research. Uh, there's another website that I particularly like, which is called Action for Happiness. And this is just an example of some of the actions at work. So they talk about sort of focus, um, find your strengths, focus on using them at work, really listen to what people are saying. Um, we do have a tendency to not listen so much. <laughs> um, get happiness on the agenda at your workplace. So this is particularly, if you're a manager, that's, that's an idea. Look for the good in those around you. Create a happier environment at work. So when you um, click on one of these actions, what it does is it takes you through, gives you a little bit of an introduction, and then takes you through to websites, um, recommended books, different sorts of surveys, and various other places. There's an app. There were a number of apps that I saw. Uh, so lots of different resources that you can use to help with this sort of thing. Uh, so the URL is there, and as I said, we are going to send you the PowerPoint. So, so besides work, they also had um, tips for family and friends, how you can sort of, in your local community as well. I'm not quite sure how many they have, but there's at least 50. Okay. So one of the resources is the CALM website, which was actually being developed here at the University of Auckland. It was developed for the med school students. Um, but it's evolved beyond that now. So anyone who wants can have a look at that website. They have a lot of resources on there. They have um, quite a lot of like meditations that you can download. I can't meditate. I'm really, yeah, I just can't do it. I'm to totally thinking about other things. But I stopped feeling so bad about that because the author of Eat, Pray, Love, who spent all that time um, in India trying to learn how to meditate, she can't meditate either. So that made me feel a lot better about that. However, that website does have a walking meditation, which I can kind of do. 
So these, you know, different strokes for different folks, I think it's called. Uh, so I've already talked about um, Pennsylvania University. Mental Health Foundation has resources as well. Oh, it's got some fantastic website with heaps of stuff. Uh, inspirational stories, um, uh, recommendations for books and these sorts of things. Uh, one of the books that uh, I've got here tonight um, came from their website. Um, so um, so, so re really, really rich resources um, uh, and, um, and a lot about resilience. Uh, Action for Happiness Resilience Scale. There's something called the Happiness Institute. <laughs> uh, and then positive psychology is um, very popular now. So that's been around since the late 80s, I think it was. These are just three of a whole lot of different books that are out there. So as Tamsin said, there's this one, Even Under Pressure, um, which you're welcome to come and have a look at. Uh, Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway. Uh, so I first read that, I think it was probably the 80s. So it was kind of before computers. So it's, I read it, reread it just recently. It's quite funny from that perspective, but it has a lot of really good stuff in it. And then um, the Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. That's also a last century book, but it's a classic. Um, just to update it a little bit, the Happiness Project um, by Gretchen Rubin. She um, has two children. She lives in New York. She's a writer. Uh, she feels guilty about wanting to be a bit, be more happy. Um, so she sort of talks about that in her book. But what she did is each month, she took just one thing that she wanted to address. So it might have been clutter. So one month, she just worked on her clutter. Another month, she pretty much said yes to everything. <laughs> um, so it was things like that. Uh, so each month, it was just a different thing, which I think is a nice, manageable way to do it. She has another book as well, which is about um, habits. Yes, and one of the reasons that we've given you all these resources is that resilience often is not something that you just are going to achieve. Uh, uh, sometimes you actually really need, do need to work at it, and that's why we've, we've given you all those resources to assist you uh, if you're struggling to, to feel, you're not feeling resilient, to give you some techniques to assist you in that process. I think um, for all of us it's something different. Like I said, um, you know, some people can't meditate, some people can. So there are sort of like different techniques that suit all of us. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we'll just leave you with this final thought. And thank you very much. <laughs>